the presentation. <laughs> um, so uh, that's a little bit about Pastor Lynn, and uh, uh, I will pass it to you. And, and thank you again so much for being with us. Oh, thank you so much. And um, how should I refer to you, Pastor Anderson? Uh, Keith is fine. Keith, Keith. Yeah. Well, there is one important fact about me that I would love to share is that I was baptized at Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church in Whittier, California. So um, Lutheran uh, tradition, my great uncle was a Lutheran minister in Missouri, and so it's good to be um, among Lutherans. So thank you for welcoming here into your fellowship. <laughs> Um, as we begin tonight, I want to invite you into a moment of um, prayer, but it'll be a different kind of prayer. Um, this is a prayer for you to bring into your heart a child for whom you care so deeply about. So this could be a, a young child, a middle schooler, high schooler, even a young adult. But think of a special young person in your life. So I'll give you a moment just to recall that child's face. What about the child makes you smile? What about this child makes you chuckle or laugh? And then as you think of this child, um, what worries or concerns do you have about this child's future? Does everyone have a, a child that has come to their mind? Great, let us pray. God, we thank you for the children, beautiful children made in your image. And we pray especially for the ones that have come into our hearts tonight. May our conversation be a blessing to each one of them, the children we know and love, and the children we have yet to meet, the children in our communities who all are deserving of your love, care, and blessings. We pray this in the holy name of the one who loves all, amen. So I am passionate about talking to churches about mental health. Um, God has just given me a real spirit of um, sharing and creating spaces safe spaces where we can um, talk about difficult things. And um, mental illness is still so highly stigmatized. You think we have come so far uh, from doing lobotomies and you know so far advanced now in our understanding of the human brain. And yet there is still significant stigma in our society and in our faith communities. In research done by LifeWay in 2013, a majority of Christians surveyed would rather have leprosy than a diagnosed mental illness. And some of that is associated with um, misunderstandings about what causes mental illness. And in our Christian tradition, there are scripture passages and there have been theologies that have made it appear as if Perhaps mental illness was a curse or a demon possession or an evil spirit and that the person is healed when the evil spirit is cast out of them. So a lot of the stories in the Bible do reference illness and healing as if it's part of a demon possession. And so that's why in our churches, there still is some stigma about what's causing the mental illness. So that a lot of uh, Christian communities are very suspicious about the medical community's view of a mental illness and will even uh, encourage faithful Christians to pray it away. You know, pray the depression away, pray the dementia away, pray the bipolar away, pray the schizophrenia away. Um, don't take your pills. You don't need the psychiatrist. Read your Bible and pray. And so that's what another survey of Christians showed, especially young adult Christians had been taught um, that if they prayed harder or, or believed better, that they would be healed. And so it really creates a community sense of shame. 
And so there is a movement now that I'm inviting you all to be part of. And it's this movement to break the silence about mental illness and to take away the stigma and shame. So that's my invitation to you, is that by being here tonight, you're already taking that important step to, to open your mind and hearts about how your faith community can be a healing community for people with mental health challenges and their loved ones. Everyone has mental health, right? Just like physical health. And I love how Patrick Kennedy says that we all need a checkup from the neck up. You know, we get our physical checkups, Kids go to the dentist for cleanings twice a year. Let's take our kids for a mental health screening twice a year and really just make it common practice. But it's the stigma that is the biggest um, barrier to getting mental health care. Our US Surgeon General, Murthy, is very outspoken about mental health, which I'm grateful for. He put out an advisory in December calling the mental health crisis facing our children and teens, um, one of the worst we've ever seen in the history of this country. It is at, at such a high level. And so he is part of a campaign by the Child Mind Institute called Dare to Share. And it's encouraging people to share just a little bit of their story about mental illness to help destigmatize it. So I'm going to share the Surgeon General's message and it's a two minute video. And so I think um, this will be really interesting for you all to hear from his perspective, why he is so passionate about mental health and especially mental health for children. So let me share my screen here and you all let me know um, how you can hear it, okay. Share sound. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Vivek Murthy, and I have the privilege of serving as US Surgeon General. I'm proud to join the Child Mind Institute for their Dare to Share campaign, because one of the biggest barriers to mental health care in our country is the stigma associated with seeking help. A stigma that tells young people that they should be embarrassed if they are struggling with depression, anxiety or loneliness. I know this because I felt this myself many years ago growing up in Miami as a shy kid who didn't look the same as other kids, whose name sounded different, and whose immigrant family didn't eat the same food or have the same traditions as other families. I often felt like I didn't fit in. And over time, I came to find, feel lonely and isolated. Now, getting bullied because of the color of my skin and my family's cultural background didn't help either. It deepened my sense of shame. I came to feel like all of this was somehow my fault and I was too embarrassed to ask for help. Unfortunately, too many kids still feel that way today. In a world of shame and stigma, where children can't get the support they need and deserve, this is not the world that I want for my kids or anyone's kids. By sharing our stories and mental health struggles with others, we can help them understand that they are not alone. By inviting others to share their mental health challenges with us, we give them a way to ask for help. We can do this with our friends, our family members, our classmates and work colleagues. Together, we have the power to create a culture where mental health is seen for what it is, part of health, and no less important than our physical health. That's a culture that supports open dialogue and open access to mental health care for all children. It's a world in which we realize that to struggle is to be human and that we all have the power to help each other heal. To learn more, or if you or a young person you know is struggling, please visit childmind.org for help and resources. Thank you. He sounds like a preacher talking about healing and telling your stories. He has such a beautiful heart and you can tell he sincerely cares about the health of all of us, especially the children. So I appreciate that he shared part of his story. That's how I've got into these spaces is by breaking the silence in my own life. And my books are the stories of my family's experiences. I am one of the one out of five uh, people who live with a mental health challenge. And part of mine was caused by my childhood. So I have 
complex post-traumatic stress disorder, growing up in a family where my father had severe, persistent, chronic bipolar disorder. And what was so hard for his illness was that his symptom of anosognesia, and that's a $50 million word, <laughs> anosognesia is a symptom more common for schizophrenia and bipolar, where it blocks self-awareness or self-insight. And so it's almost like the brain is protecting itself from knowing that it has a disorder or a disease. And so throughout his um, adult life from age, I think 45 until he died at 65, he had such serious mental illness, but he refused any kind of help and treatment or medication or hospitalization or seeing a doctor. And it was just tragic because he could have been helped, our family could have been helped. And so a lot of folks who are seriously mentally ill and living on the streets who are homeless, who can't hold a job, who can't stay in relationships, a lot of them have this anosognesia. Um, and so I wrote a book to help me tell the story, to help find some healing and to say, God, where were you? Where were you in our family when everything was turned upside down? My poor mom raising five children alone with my dad um, who couldn't work anymore. And we became homeless as a family. Uh, we had to go live with relatives. And my mom got a job as a substitute teacher. We went on food stamps and I just had to really struggle through a very difficult time. And so I felt that stigma of having a father who was homeless, who hallucinated, who had delusions, and then we were in poverty. And it was very traumatic because things were so uncertain. And my father's moods would swing. He would say outrageous things, threaten things. He kidnapped my siblings and tried to kidnap me. Um, and so all of that is in my first book. Um, and it felt like it was a way to invite God into those spaces, the spaces that were very overwhelming and scary and threatening. I asked, where was God in those moments? And so telling the stories helps me claim the faithfulness of God in all the hard parts. And I know you all are shaking your heads. You know, you've had hard, hard, hard parts of your life have been very hard. And as people of faith, um, it can be powerful to, to reflect on how God showed up in the hard parts of our lives. My brother also um, was diagnosed with bipolar disorder as a high school student. And um, luckily he got treatment, um, but he now is on full disability with his bipolar. It's a very serious uh, brain disease for him. And now in my family, the third generation has bipolar disorder. Um, my father died from it. He couldn't get it treated. My brother is gonna be 50 and full disability. Um, he cannot work. He uh, can barely just get through the day uh, because it's so serious. He lives every day with thoughts of suicide. And so he's in therapy, he goes to support groups. Um, and now the third generation, so a 12 year old in my family has just been diagnosed with bipolar. And so um, it's my family's reality and my reality. And so I wrote uh, my second book was called Blessed Union. And it's, um, you know, what does it look like in a marriage that has mental illness? You know, I have my PTSD and my husband has depression and anxiety and addictions, uh, but we love each other and we wanna stay married and it's very hard to navigate all of that. So Blessed Union, if you're interested in that topic, um, that's a resource. And then my new book um, that I was invited here to share with you about continues to look at our faith and how God is calling us to respond now to children and teens who are having higher and higher rates of depression and anxiety and unfortunately suicide. I had just written my, se my second book and uh, my niece died by suicide and we were shocked. She was only 16. She was the most well person in my family. So maybe your families have kind of people who you know are sick and people who are healthy and you imagine their futures. So she was gonna be our doctor. 
She was going to be our astronaut. She was going to be the president of the United States, the top of her class. Her uh, semester in high school, she was taking six AP classes. And um, we were just, our world fell apart when she died. And I talked to my publisher a week later and I said, I have to write this book. I, I just have to figure out you know, how God is showing up in, in our children and in times where our children are dying by suicide. And so it was a healing effort to research that and to write the story. And it's really a love letter to my niece. And it's a place where I apologize that I was part of the problem. And that's the hard truth is that um, the stigma that we talk about, there's a lot of self stigma. We don't think it will happen to us. We don't think it will happen to our kids or that child that I invited you to imagine because this type of thing happens to other people and other people's families and other schools or other churches. And um, that is just not true anymore. So how as people of faith, can we really help support and protect our children and teenagers and give them the tools that they need? And so that is uh, my new book, Blessed Youth. And so I wanna share with you some uh, slides and then we'll have some some conversation together. Okay, so that just talks a little bit about um, my ministry and my books. And this is the, the first book that I talked to the publisher, you know, just to break the silence about um, mental illness with children and teens. But then we decided we really need a second book. We want a, a book for the children, uh, a little pocket-sized uh, survival guide. And so this book uh, really came from God and was, was born out of the, the desire to put into the hands of children and teens resources. So I'm really excited about this one because it has interactive pages where you can doodle your feelings, you can doodle what does depression look like, what does anxiety look like. You can create a personalized mental health toolkit. So there's a section in here where you ask, you know, who's your school counselor? Who's your school social worker? What mental health resources are in your network? You know, talk to your parents about your insurance and who could you talk to for counseling? And then there is a safety pledge. Um, what I learned from my niece's story is that she had shared with peers previous attempts and her upcoming attempt. But we are not teaching our children what to do when a peer discloses this information. And she did not tell any adults. And so what we created in the survival guide is a safety pledge where the, the children and teens are promising that if they're having thoughts of suicide or self-harm, they will tell three trusted adults. So they, they write their name and there's a witness and they write the names of the three adults and their phone numbers. And we help them understand how important it is not to just to tell one, but three. And I've had psychologists, PhDs and professors at Harvard affirm that this is the, the best practice strategy. You tell more than one adult. And when you pick your three, you let them know that they're your three. And you can even have a code word so that when you're having this come up, maybe it's giraffe or it's you know unicorn. You have a word that you agree on that when you're starting to feel this way, this is what you're going to share. And then there's a plan of how to respond. And I, I do believe that if my niece had had that kind of plan, that she would still be alive. So that's why I call this a love letter. And that's where the healing comes in. I could not save her life, but maybe together we can save the lives of other youth. So it's okay to not be okay. This is a basic message and it's one that we need to get comfortable saying to each other. Um, there's a real generational difference, especially in the church 
And what I've noticed talking to youth groups is that um, youth are not comfortable talking to church folks about how they're really doing. And when I asked uh, the youth about that, I said, well, why aren't you comfortable talking to church folks about how you're really feeling? And they said, well, you know, we grew up in this church. And when they look at us, they think of us as these smiley, happy little kids. And we don't want to disappoint them. So they're not, they're not feeling like they can really be honest that they're not okay. And my hope is that we can change the culture, right? And one way we can change the culture is to model. And so when we aren't okay, that we drop the stigma and we say, you know, I'm not okay today. And this is why, and create that authentic space. And our children are paying attention to that. And this is a, a good a statistic to draw your attention to. What stories do the numbers tell? Um, U.S. youth age six to seven, they um, experience uh, mental illness um, at high rates. And so 50% of all lifetime mental illness begins by age 14. My, my nephew at 12 diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And then by 24, the majority, 75% have uh, been diagnosed. These numbers below have doubled during the pandemic. So these were pre-pandemic numbers. And now NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness is saying two in five. So, so now it's, it's getting to be half the population. This is a resource to refer you to, to watch. Uh, the New York Times is doing a really powerful series about teen and children mental health. And so this is a video you can watch. It's about 18 minutes and it's called Worried Sick, Journey into the Anxious Teenage Mind. And so it really, it asks that question, you know, why are teenagers more anxious, stressed and suicidal than ever before? Part of it they're saying is the extreme sense of isolation, um, people not feeling truly connected. A lot of, um, relationships happening on the internet, which are not deep enough to feel like real connection. But why do I talk about blessed? You know, blessed are the crazy, blessed union, blessed youth. I want to claim that we are blessed even in the hardest parts of our lives. Blessed is a word that honors our whole story Blessed means we are more than the mental illness, the shame and stigma. Blessed means we are more than the labels, we're more than the diagnosis. Blessed means we are holy. We are whole. We are blessed. I was with a group of young clergy and they saw my second book about marriage and mental illness and that one pastor who had a few different, he had anxiety, depression, and his wife was a big support to him. He said that he brought this book home to his wife and showed it to her. And she looked at the cover and he said, she got so angry because she did not like that I was saying it's a blessed union uh, because for her, the challenges and the struggles of the mental illness in their marriage did not feel blessed. And so that is the work. For us to ask, you know, where's God showing up, you know, in the struggle and in, in that marriage, you know, that felt so challenged by mental illness, how can we find the blessing? And that really is, an, is the invitation of the church. You know, how can the church show up, pour out love, compassion, and support upon families, couples, children who are really feeling cursed? Because even though we might understand it's a brain disease and a brain disorder, it feels like a curse, right? It, it can just feel so hard. What God stories do we tell about mental health? This is the invitation for the church for us to break the silence about mental illness with children at church by telling our stories about God's care for our mental health that God cares for all of creation, that we are made in God's image. And that is really powerful theology from a disability theology perspective, because sometimes like people with born with dwarfism, for example, 
uh, you might wonder, is a child born with dwarfism made in God's image? Yes. Yes. And so just to teach our, our littlest children that no matter how you're born, if it's like my family, invisible disability, the bipolar disorder, are people in my family who have bipolar made in God's image? Yes. Yes. And so we can start talking to our kids about this at a very young age. Blessed are the teens. Teenagers are so blessed. They have so much power within them, um, power to create and destroy, power to remake, um, and power for transformation. And teenagers often need to be reminded that they have power, that they um, are powerful, and that there is hope because their struggle that they're going through is a struggle of transformation. And that no matter how bad it is right now, it will get better, right? It's that transformation, those growing pains. And so for our kids to really hear that message from us. In my book, I talk also about uh, the schools because I believe that faith communities can be community partners and that there are ways that pastors and churches can connect to what's happening in our schools. Our schools are blessed because that's where our youth get empowered to take flight and to soar into the future with strength and hope. Churches can ask schools, what type of resources do they need? You know, do they need someone to volunteer to start a mental health club? That is a really successful model that's taking off around the country, is working with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, working with volunteers from a church, and working with the students before school. And this is a club where kids can get support, but they also develop really important leadership skills. And that's what I love about empowering and educating young people like my nephew who has bipolar disorder. They want to become a psychologist, right? Because they've seen how much they have been helped. Their life has been saved by mental health professionals and they wanna become one. So that's what I love about these clubs because it's helping the children and teens and it's giving them leadership skills to support their dreams of their future. Is it safe to ask for help? Back to that earlier message about, you know, do your kids in your faith community feel safe asking, is it okay to not be okay? I encourage you all to empower your youth to create these intentional spaces, whether it's a mental health club at school, there's a church in Ohio that's starting a mental health club at the church. And it's a space where they can ask questions, they can learn, and they can support each other and find ways to get help. What can we do to bless our youth? As parents, faith communities, as schools, as the wider community, one of the big things we can do, and you're doing it tonight, is you educate yourself. So yay, <laughs> you're doing it, you're learning, you're, you're growing. The second thing is to take care of our own mental health. There's been so much research that shows that children are impacted by the mental health and wellness of their care providers, right? And there's deep research about intergenerational trauma and how the trauma and challenges of one generation really get passed on. And so you can be the one to break the cycle. You can be the one to, to get a help, to get treatment, to begin that recovery, and that will bless future generations. So once you're educated, once you're taking care of your own mental health, you can be an advocate. You can have the clarity and the focus of mind to be an advocate. And I love that faith communities are really well positioned because we can be the bridge. We can be a bridge between the school, the mental health professionals, we can talk to elected officials, we can look at the budget and be an advocate for more funding for mental health care, more um, social workers in the schools. Uh, the research shows that there are more schools with security officers and police officers than nurses. 
So I don't know what you think of that data point, but our schools have more security officers in our schools uh, than nurses. We also know that communities that are supportive of um, open and affirming in the LGBT community um, are a blessing to teens because it's a natural time in human development and questioning their sexuality. They want to explore and they need safe places to do that. Part of the tragedy in our family was uh, my niece who died, she was at a church where their confirmation class taught the children that it was a sin uh, to be LGBTQ. And um, it harmed her soul. It, it harmed her, it permanently harmed her. Uh, and that is a great tragedy uh, that that harm was done. So your church can bless youth by creating a space where it's okay. There's no judgment. There's only love and support. So here is the resource. Um, as I said, there's the two books. This is the primary book. That's a great conversation starter. And then this is that survival guide that I would love to get into the hands of every um, young person. So I am going to stop um, the presentation at this point. And thank you for your close attention and invite some conversation, some dialogue. I've shared a lot of information. Um, I want to pause and invite you to recall the child that we began with. And just as you think of that child um, and what you heard today, uh, what's stirring in your heart. And just